My name is uh, Bill Linehan, and I'm the chair of the uh, Committee on Planning and Development. I'm here with uh, fellow committee members and uh, colleagues. Uh, to my right, Councillor Salah Martina, Councillor Mark Siomo, um, Councillor Josh Zakem to my left, and we're expecting Councillor Flaherty at, at any moment. Uh, the subject of the hearing is docket 0881, an order for a hearing regarding a medical marijuana dispensary at 331 Newberry Street in the Back Bay. Uh, this matter is sponsored by Councillor Josh Zakem and was referred to the Committee in, of Planning and Development on June 14th of this year. I'd like to remind folks that, um, that this uh, particular hearing is being recorded and it's uh, recorded um, and will also is playing live at this time. Uh, City Council TV is now uh, available uh, 24 uh, hours a day and uh, seven days a week for those who may want to uh, catch up on uh, further um, hearings and the like. Um, so at this time, we'd like to um, uh, welcome the presenters who are, um, and, and I'd say context is probably a good idea. The, the Boston City Council, based on state uh, regulations, um, needs to uh, approve non-opposition to a dispensary, a medical marijuana dispensary in the city of Boston. And that's it. That's the crux of it. So what we do is we listen to um, how folks will operate and um, where it's located, impacts on the community, security, and the like. And then um, after we hear this, we give uh, opportunity for the public and others to testify, if they so. And, um, and then we would, uh, um, if we bring the matter forward out of committee, it would then uh, be a vote to uh, not oppose or oppose um, this particular uh, siting and location of a me medical marijuana dispensary. So um, I, we're going to welcome uh, Councillor Frank Baker, who's also joined us. And um, we'll, um, who's going to start? Oh, well, uh, we'd like to welcome back uh, our dear friend and uh, past colleague, uh, Michael Ross. Michael. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for scheduling this hearing and for having us here today. Uh, and thank you, uh, Councillors Lamatina, Siomo, Zakum, and Baker uh, for being here. Uh, my name is Mike Ross. Uh, I'm an attorney at the law firm of Prince Lobel, and I represent Compassionate Organics, uh, who's before you today. Our purpose here, as the chairman mentioned, is to present materials uh, and answer questions of the committee regarding a proposed medical marijuana dispensary to be located at 331 Newberry Street in the Back Bay. Uh, I'm joined by uh, the following members of our team today. To my left is Jeff Rylinger, the CEO of Compassion Organics. Next to him is Dot Joyce, who is our communications consultant. And next to her is Frank Peterson, who is filling in today for uh, Dan Linsky. Frank is a former member of the Boston Police Department, and he also works with Dan Linsky, the former superintendent in chief of the Boston Police Department at Kroll Security, um, which is a recognized international security firm. Kroll is working with Compassion Organics to handle all security measures. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dan Linsky is on the West Coast today, and we even looked at possibly having him fly in for this uh, and just couldn't make it happen. So um, Frank offered to, to be here today in, in his stead, and we really appreciate uh, Frank's uh, uh, presence today. Uh, I just wanted to quickly, if I may, go over our proposal. Uh, we it, kind of at the top level, and then uh, open it up to questions uh, after we go over a little bit of that. We have a uh, leave behind a, um, a deck that hopefully all the members have uh, that will be loosely based uh, or with more detailed, and my comments will be loosely based on what you have in front of you. Compassion Organics has been searching for the perfect location that meets the strict state and local standards uh, to operate a registered medical marijuana dispensary in Boston uh, since just after the 2012 ballot initiative. This organization was formed by a local entrepreneur, uh, Jeff, and his board, who are all or almost all members 
uh, of our community, of uh, many who, who live in Boston. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we have board members uh, in the attendance, one, one of which is uh, Joel Pierce, who is uh, a Beacon Hill resident. He's also a member of the Beacon Hill Architectural Commission, and um, Joel's in the middle over there. I uh, appreciate him being here as well. Um, so uh, Jeff uh, also grew up on Marlboro Street in the Back Bay, uh, has lived there his whole life, and uh, it, it, it in many ways brought him to this location at 331 Newberry. Uh, the location's on the last block of Newberry Street. Uh, it sits in a community that overwhelmingly approved the ballot initiative back in 2012 by 77% of its residents. Uh, the location meets all buffer requirements. It fits within the existing zoning. It complies with the amendment passed by this council and advanced into the zoning code, the half mile restriction. Uh, key to this location is that it's ADA compliant, um, it, which is not an easy thing to find in, in a historic district. Um, it's about 3,000 square feet. There's some plans in your handout uh, with the dispensary sited on the uh, ground floor and office space uh, located in the basement. Uh, the dispensary will serve those qualifying patients who require its treatment, patients with cancer, glaucoma, HIV AIDS, Crohn's disease, and other ailments. Our proposal is to be open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Our plan is to have daily deliveries to the dispensary so that no more than one day supply is on site at any one time. Our cultivation site is in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and the security plan advanced by Dan Linsky and his team will call for randomized deliveries made safely and, security, uh, and securely by members of our security team. Unlike some dispensary, all of the product is, uh, for this dispensary is, is prepackaged in childproof containers, and so that in no case is there even any loose leaf products. Everything is, is, is um, packaged. Boston has uh, solid experience. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, in permitting dispensaries. Uh, there are 10 existing dispensaries in operation in Massachusetts currently today, as I understand, uh, with many more scheduled to open. And here in Boston, uh, by my count, I, I believe just one is open and at least three more are in the process of opening. Uh, we know a lot more today than when we first, the dispensaries were first opened. We know that the average patient is just over 40 years old, that the costs per transaction well exceed that of the black market, uh, and that anecdotally, the security that dispensaries bring to their immediate host communities uh, do so by making that community safer. Uh, we've also uh, already begun the community process uh, with regard to this location. We, we are meeting with our abutters. Uh, we have been in discussions with the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay and have a hearing scheduled with their licensing subcommittee in early July. Uh, their chair, incidentally, is here, Elliot Laffer, uh, with his colleague, um, Martin Rutter, uh, both of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay. Um, he's there here today. Uh, we uh, have been in other discussions with the other organizations of the community, the Back Bay Association and the Newberry Street League and others. Uh, we've been buoyed by some of the public comments that have been spontaneously made uh, by some of our immediate neighbors. Uh, in, a, in a Boston Herald article that was recently written, the manager of the Trident Bookstore and Cafe said that, quote, we attract an eclectic clientele. Some of them probably would enjoy a dispensary. And the general manager of Sansi Restaurant said, quote, it would bring a lot of business to the area. This block has a lot of young people that are looking for that. At this point, I'd like to introduce our CEO, Jeff Reilinger. Uh, Jeff's own story and reasons for becoming involved in this industry are quite compelling. As a person who has suffered from the condition of multiple sclerosis, he has been helped and aided by medical marijuana. Since beginning his treatment, he has yet to have a relapse or a flare for almost 18 years. Indeed, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society now supports the rights of patients to gain access to medical marijuana treatment. As I mentioned, Jeff is also a lifelong resident of the Back Bay, and that makes this a truly locally run business, which for this particular industry is quite a statement. Jeff? 
Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Councilor Linehan, Councilor Zakem, and the entire committee. I appreciate the opportunity to present our proposal for registered marijuana dispensary at 331 Newbury. Transportation. The building is privately owned. Barely. Barely. The building is privately owned. No, it's not on. Jeff, why you take down? No, no, the, the, the little button at the bottom should be green. There you go, Jeff. There you also, go. Oh, okay. Takes a woman. Musical uh, musical chairs here. <laughs> should I start over or should I pick? No, you just might move to Shay. You should just have him testify whatever you're going to say. <laughs> so, I'm so, sorry. Go ahead. Please. Uh, so, so the reason we, we, we appreciate this location is it's close to public transportation. It's fully ADA accessible. And it's privately owned and large enough to accommodate our use, which is pretty specific. In addition, as Mike mentioned, 77% of residents in this area voted for this use in 2012 on the ballot question. The building itself is in a sector of the city, again, as Mike said, that meets all state and local zoning regulations and siting guidelines. And as you know, I've been working towards finding the right location in Boston for some time. While I wasn't successful in Alston, I did learn an enormous amount from that experience. And I want to publicly affirm my intentions to run a top-notch facility in our city. Since last year, Compassion Organics has enlisted the help of Kroll Associates and specifically Danny Linsky, who unfortunately couldn't be with us, but we have Frank. Um, as most of you know, prior to his work in private consultancy, Dan was a 27-year veteran and then chief of BPD, where he oversaw and managed countless high-profile security events. We've also engaged the law practice uh, of Prince Lobel and attorney Mike Ross next to me. And in addition, we've reestablished the, our commitment with our board of directors who continue to offer guidance and assistance to the organization. And again, as we mentioned, Joel Pierce is sitting in the back row. I'm proud of the team that we've assembled of local talent, local board, local capital. I also want to take this opportunity to apologize for falling short in my last effort to open a dispensary in Austin. I'm not happy with how we performed as a team, how I performed, and of course, I was disappointed, disappointed by the result. To that end, I've written a letter apologizing to the Councilor Siomo for not meeting the standards he and all of you should expect and demand from applicants like me. Mark's diligence and concern for his community is undeniable. And me and my application are better for the experience and the opportunity that bring me here to present to you again today. Thank you for your consideration. And we look forward to addressing any questions or concerns that you might have about 331 Newbury Street. And thanks for the microphone. Just um, finally, Mr. Chair, um, we did want to offer uh, Frank Peterson an opportunity just to address the, the committee, if possible. Yep. First, I'd like to underscore the fact that uh, I'm a substitute for Danny Linsky. But Danny guaranteed be, there'd be no tough questions from the council. <laughs> I'd like to read this. My background is uh, I was a probation officer in South Boston Court, moved on from there to security with water and sewer, and then chief of the municipal police, and landed in City Hall as chief of security here and retired two years ago. Since then, I've been on contract with Crow Organization, uh, actually with Danny Linsky. So I'll read my script here for you people. The Kroll Security Plan is a combination of next generation technologies, talented security professionals, and a company wide commitment to safety. Leading our team's security efforts for the project is Director of Security Daniel P. Linsky. Compassionate Organics has engaged Kroll in our services to develop and address the safe, safety and security protocols we believe necessary to exceed the strict standards set by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the City of Boston. Crow has also been involved intimately with the compliance procedures for proposed registered medical marijuana dispensary and operations. Compassionate Organics' proposed location of 331 Newbury Street is a 1,535-square-foot convenient, well-lit facility that will provide dispensary services on the main floor and corporate office space on the lower level, including separate receiving entrance on Public Alley 430. 
The building is well suited for the state of art camera and lighting system that will be fully integrated with the city's existing camera operations to allow BPD or Boston Police Department to access more areas of the city. Crow will employ a two alarm security system to allow for backup and redundancy in the facility. We intend to utilize innovative analytical video processing technology that features CCCTV system tied to a central monitoring hub that is staffed 24 hours, seven days a week. Our company is highly regarded, award-winning global security company with offices here in the United States, Europe, Africa, and Asia. In the safeguarding of our dispensary facility here at 331 Newbury Street, we will work in partnership with the surrounding community and the Boston Police Department. Once permitted, we will request follow-up meetings with BPD to discuss security concern and establish open lines of communication with key law enforcement personnel and community liaisons. Kroll's core security principles guide the inner workings of a compassionate, organic security plan and its features including safeguarding and incoming transfer storage and dispensation of the medicine, providing a safe and secure environment for the dispensary staff and patients, managing an authorized egress, ingress and egress to the dispensary facility and to restricted access areas within the facility, and ensuring strict compliance with the Massachusetts law and Department of Public Health regulations regarding marijuana with the medical use program guidelines. As our affiliates have done in other jurisdictions, Compassion Organic intends to hire professional security personnel with preference for former law enforcement and military service. Thank you. Um, thank you, Frank. Thank you. And uh, I can remember um, your tenure here. Um, and how long were you the chief of security here in City Hall? Six, six um, seven years. Seven years. And uh, you did a, a fine job. And Dan Linsky also has a, a great reputation, as do you. So um, we're excited that you guys are involved. Thank you. That's our formal presentation, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to give um, the district city councilor uh, from um, uh, Newbury Street area, uh, Councilor Josh Aikman, an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your presentation. <clears throat> I certainly appreciate hearing more about the specifics of this project um, as we obviously have this necessary step in the approval process. Um, I do notice that folks from the Neighborhood Association are here, and I expect they'll have some comments later. Um, but I think as, as this moves forward, both at this stage uh, for a potential vote in the council, as you continue through the process, um, that neighborhood input uh, is incredibly important. Obviously, it's nice anecdotally to hear from some of your business neighbors, but obviously the residents in the area um, who may have concerns. So I hope you'll continue that outreach. Um, can you talk a little more about what your timeline is uh, in the approval process, both here, then it's my understanding you go to the state, then the uh, ZBA. Um, what sort of time frame is that, or what are the other steps uh, in an approval if uh, this council chooses to act favorably today, or, uh, on this, uh, on today's hearing? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if you go to your, I guess, third to last page um, in the uh, packet, there's a fairly handy uh, timeline which shows that we're actually pretty very near to the beginning, uh, listed under uh, June 2017, the second bullet point. And you'll see that there's six bullet points to the right uh, with additional bullets under each that represent substantial number of steps that we need to comply with. Uh, I guess the broad brushstrokes uh, for us are um, immediately uh, our next uh, step is going to be a meeting with the Neighborhood Association in the Back Bay at the, before their licensing committee. We're meeting in the second week of July. Um, you know, it's possible we might do another meeting with them. You know, that will be up to the discretion of, of that committee. Um, we've already done some initial outreach uh, with the community, but for the next, I'd say, good month plus, a couple months, we're doing the community outreach and process. Um, that is all leading up to what is essentially a, a zoning case. Um, as, you, as you likely know, uh, medical marijuana is a conditional use in this location. Uh, and so we would have to go before the Zoning Board of Appeal for 
a uh, conditional use permit. Uh, we've made no such application at this time uh, for an appeal, but that's sketched out sometime in uh, between September and November. And we anticipate that we will uh, be before them then, provided that everything goes well. Um, once we get, if we are approved at that point, we then have to go uh, back to the Department of Public Health uh, to submit uh, and to, uh, to get our, uh, our approval. I actually skipped a step um, upon, just prior to the zoning process, uh, the, the Department of Public Health would provisionally approve us for this site, and it's provisional on our ability to actually um, go forward with the local um, zoning process. So if we are successful with that, we go back to DPH for a little bit more uh, process through that, uh, and then we also have to go to uh, the Boston Public Health uh, Commission, um, and we also have to go to the public, uh, to the um, uh, Back Bay Architectural Commission. Any changes, any signage, any anything on the outside will require the, ba the Back Bay Architectural Commission. So those are all fairly substantial steps. Once all of those things have happened, um, we can then uh, begin uh, building the, the, the property out uh, and then we would eventually go for our final uh, certificate of registration from the Department of Public Health. And, we, and we, we believe that that would take us all the way out to basically a year from today. Mm. Uh, and then we don't think we'll even be uh, ready to sell until August of 2018. While that's happening, Jeff and his colleagues are also going to be building out the um, cultivation site in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. So that's where they're growing the marijuana, and nowhere else but Fitchburg will they be doing so. So that entire site has to get up and running. It has to. It, it, that, there's a substantial timeline for that as well. And so if everything goes perfect, we'll be uh, we'll be good by August 2018. So, but there's a lot that has to. So happen. there's quite a few regulatory steps uh, yes, sir. beyond this. Um, so as far as uh, the use here, um, I guess there's two two aspects uh, of my question. My next question is. You know, the state is continuously revising. Um, I believe they're in session today, I think, to talk about their changes to um, both medical and recreational marijuana, potentially. Do you anticipate much of this process changing? Um, have you been monitoring that with the understanding that maybe no one knows what yeah. they're actually doing right now? Um, but do you anticipate any significant changes in this approval process? Not for medical. No. Not for medical. Um, we are watching what's happening at the state level. Um, and um, you know, we obviously have, uh, we care what happens out of there. I mean, I might as well address the issue if, if you want me to of, of recreational. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is obviously something that's, I think, important, uh, for people considering whether this is an appropriate location. Right. Um, obviously I think the impacts and the siting of a medical dispensary are far different than a recreational, yeah. uh, dispensary or store. So I don't know what your intentions are or what the potential would be. I know when we were talking about other locations, that have been approved in the city, there have been commitments uh, from the proponent that it was a medical uh, dispensary location only, regardless of changes in state law. Yeah. Is that something that you are similarly committing to, or where, where are you on that? So the, our answer to that is we're going to do whatever the city tells us to do, and we're also going to do whatever, to that extent, you know, as informed by the neighborhood. Mm. Um, we, we would want to keep our options open as it relates to re um, recreational. Um, but if we're told that that's not desired in this location, then we're not going to pursue it. Mm -hmm. We do think that there's an argument where we might uh, want to be a recreational in the eyes of the neighborhood or possibly the city in that, depending on how the legislation is written, um, not having a recreational site in that location could cause a, the need for a second recreational site to open near that location, notwithstanding the, the half mile rule, which still needs to be um, amended uh, once that new zoning uh, classification comes in. And so if that were to be changed or amended, you know, perhaps the half mile rule would have an effect around the zoning. And these are all hypotheticals. If the state law do allows that, doesn't allow that. So these are, these are things we have to watch. Yeah, no, it's hard. And in my discussions with neighbors, it's hard for us yeah. I think to come to some of these decisions because so much is in limbo uh, up at the state house. Um, and then my final 
uh, questions that Cou Counselor, uh, if I could, to, to, in response to the question, you said, one of the things, because that question is asked a lot, and as you said, it's evolving continuously. We don't know where this is going. And that's okay for a new program. I mean, it should be evolving as we're going down the road. But one of the things that I say to people is, I'm doing this for medical. I will forever sell medical marijuana at 331 Newberry Street. Mm -hmm. I will forever be bound by the incredible tight requirements and restrictions of medical marijuana at 331 Newberry Street. Now, as Mike said, there may be reasons that the community wants me, the state wants me. I might also choose to do recreational, possibly, but I will still be bound by those parameters. And usually when people say, oh, no recreational, they don't want lines and drum circles outside. I can't have that as medical. I can't have all these things that people fear. So that's one of the things that we can absolutely commit to right now, not knowing how things are taking shape in the future. So that should hopefully give people peace of mind that forever we'll be bound by these tight restrictions of medical for as long as we're in existence. And then last question, I know some of my colleagues also have questions. Um, as far as, you know, you have a good, great graphic in here of, um, the surrounding area and, you know, where they, here it is, the, uh, where youth regularly gather. Um, you know, some of my neighbors ha have asked about um, a program at the Boston Architectural College, which is within the radius uh, of your location. Have you examined that? Do you know what the state's um, feeling is on whatever type of, uh, I think it's a summer enrichment program that they run? Does, yeah. that, does that fall under the prohibition? Are, have you been able to look into that at all? Yeah, yeah, uh, we're aware of that program. And uh, maybe I preface it by saying we originally had a site in, um, on Massachusetts Avenue right. that was very, it was within 500 feet of a place that we felt was substantially more a place where children commonly gather. Um, and even that was something of a jump ball because these things aren't always black and white. You know, the extent of the program uh, the regularness of the program, um, the consistency of the program, the advertising of the program, all those things contribute. And now that we've, this has been out for a few years, there's a little bit of case law on this, a little bit. So we have a better understanding of what that means. It, it was relatively vague language. We made the decision to move from Mass Ave to this other site, uh, knowing what's around us, including the program you reference. And we do not believe that that program rises to the level of the language that's in the statute. And, and DPH makes that determination during their next step review process? Or? Both both the state and the city, uh -huh. um, through the Boston Public Health Commission, the DPH uh -huh. uh, determined that. So in the event that we were proved wrong, uh, we, would, we would just propose and the regulations allow for amending our license so as to not to open during the period that those, the, the, the brief period that that particular program is in play. All right. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Council of Zaken. Uh, Vice Chairman Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, Michael, just confirm that this location is a half a mile from the next closest medicinal facility? Yes, it is. Very good. And then the cultivation facility, that, is that currently up and running? Not yet. We, so we have a site and a location, but we have not begun construction. Okay. And in the event that sort of opening day of potentially uh, August 2018, if the cultivation facility is not running or product is not available, what's, what happens then? We will not be able to open. There is a provision in the legislation that allows for up to 30% to be purchased from another um, uh, cultivation site uh, for certain circumstances and for emergency circumstances. Jeff would, uh, could avail himself of that provision, provided that he could demonstrate the level of, of, of uh, the statute, but more likely we would not open until our own product is ready. And is the cultivation facility not up and running because you're still waiting sort of for council approval before you can get more aggressive? That's correct. In order to proceed to the next step, we need to have both a cultivation and a dispensary. We can have up to three dispensaries, but you need at least one dispensary for us to move to the next level and to feel like we can actually build the cultivation center and to be approved by DPH to do so. And will the cultivation facility be... Uh, servicing other dispensaries or just this current facility just, or, uh, or other ones that you may own in the future? It may service other compassion organic dispensaries in the event that Jeff chooses to do so. As of now, Jeff has been solely focused on a single dispensary, um, and this right now is his, is his uh, only focus. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, Councilor Siamo.
Hello. You got it. Thank you. Well, first, first, let me say to Mr. Reilinger, um, I really appreciate the apology and accept it. Um, we had a rough go, without question. We did. <laughs> um, but we're here now. It's in my my um, colleague's district, and I'm you know anxious to hear from some of your residents and and some of the other folks that are here today. Uh, but I have no questions because uh, my colleagues asked and they were answered. So thank you. I uh, thank you, Council Siomo. Council Lamatina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, first, you got a nice group working for you. So <laughs> it's great to see Frank Pierce. Um, so we just approved one in, uh, in East Boston, McCollin Highway. Um, something that. Uh, and East Boston voted to support it um, overwhelmingly in East Boston medical marijuana. And it's something we learned when we went to Colorado, though. Sometimes when you go to neighborhood groups. He's got to get that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but sometimes you go to neighborhood it's groups. The neighborhood groups oppose it. And that's what happened in East Boston. And um, they opposed the one on McCollin Highway and, and passed from us. Um, I hope that the state does the right thing in regards to, uh, and they told us this when we went to Colorado, is the medical and recreational at the same site. So you don't have all these different sites in one neighborhood. So I hope that the state will do, do, will do that. But I also saw that uh, I'm concerned about your one day of supply. How is that going to help you in the winter time if there's a snowstorm? You know what I mean? Your patients might need it. So. Do you want that, Frank? Yeah. No. But Can you I'll like store it. more? Like you have a vault in your building. Can you store more than a one day supply? It's my understanding from uh, Dan Linsky that we have an uh, or will have an armored car uh, security service that will be able to transport from the Fitchburg area. That's the best I can tell you at this yeah. point. Well, let my concern is if there's a snowstorm and we're. Yeah, let me just I understand. You know what I mean? Let me fill in the details on that. Our operating principle is to to go with one day, um, simply because when 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 marijuana is delivered to the to the dispensary, this is not a you know this is not a truck backing up. This is a very small light uh, um, impact in terms of automobile and and, a, and access. Um, so the impact is very small. Um, number one, number two, we have an existing uh, parking space uh, in the back of our building, and we don't want to get too far into the details of how we're going to bring that in, but we're happy to do so in executive session if you'd like us to. We just, you know, we're we're on television yeah. here. Um, our plan would be to do once per day, just so that we don't have an attractive nuisance in our in our location for someone to come along and and see a target, see an see an opportunity. Um, but of course, we can we we will have the ability to forecast a couple of few days. It's yeah. not a size issue; it's more of a security issue. Yeah. Um, we did tour the Milk Street one recently, Patriots and Milk Street, and I had no idea that was the location. And um, so, hopefully, the same thing will happen over here. But to me, it looks like they have a good proposal. But again. I will <laughs> wait to hear from my district city council that represent that district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, thank you, Councilor LaMartina. I, I should have recognized uh, uh, Councilor Tim McCarthy. He recognized himself. <laughs> <laughs> who brought a nice uh, haircut, too. All of our attention to him just a minute ago. But, Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, yeah. Mike. How are you? Thanks for bringing you. Frank. Peterson with you, you know, you don't yeah. get to see him very much. Um, uh, Mike, you had said that, that the cost, and through the data and what you're seeing coming in, the cost is exceeding the black market now? Good. That's correct. Like, by, by, like, is it double the black market? Because, I mean, ideally, what, we, what I think the end game here is to eliminate the black market. Yeah, the idea is, you're right, Councillor, is to be competitive with the black market so that you are eliminating eventually the black market with this industry. So Correct. how far out of line is, is the pricing? I couldn't speak to some of the other dispensaries as state law uh, regulates. You are not allowed to advertise the price of medical marijuana in the state. Mm. So therefore, um, it's very difficult to know exactly unless you're a patient at those sites. Yeah. I would say that uh, the more dispensaries that are coming online, as supply and demand would have, the lower the yeah. price will come. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff, you're growing in Pittsburgh. Can you talk about the grow a little bit? How big, uh, what's the square footage of your actual grow operation? Sure. The, the grow, we're starting a, a building that's almost 60,000 square feet, but we're utilizing half of it to start. Um, so we'll be in roughly 30 and, and 30 and change. Um, and we're doing what's called controlled, architect, controlled environment agriculture. So we'll be growing, and you actually have a floor plan in, in your packets at the end um, behind the site plan. And so each room will be growing a particular amount, and the, the vegetative rooms down the center will kind of stock those rooms, and they'll go out to the flower. And that way, if we have an infestation problem, which is much, much lower, controlled environment means I'm not taking in outside air. I'm keeping uh, everything's inside, so there's no contaminants. Mm -hmm. But if I have a problem, it's only one of 15 or 17 rooms that has a problem. So to speak to running out of supply, the question was asked earlier, um, we wouldn't have that issue. So it goes through from the bedroom to the flower room, through the processing um, and the curing stage, then it gets shipped out or utilized in products. <clears throat> and you're in, you're in half of, of the 60,000 square feet. Do you, do you own the building? We will ultimately own the building, and we expect that we'll end up growing into the other half. Right now, there's an existing operator from the person who owned the building, and they're kind of phasing out of their business. So we'll grow into that as our needs grow. Because your build out, what, what, what's your typical, what's your build out going to be, a, a couple million or? It'll be up there. Yeah. It'll be up there. So, no you, you, so for for stability, I think for our neighborhoods and people coming in, I think it's important that that you own the building that you're doing you're doing you grow in. I, I feel the same. And again, we we have what's called a lease purchase agreement in place. Yeah. So it's I lease for three years and then it's owned. Okay. So so you're a user and and it helped you with your MS enormously. I mean, well, it, 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 it's hard hard to say. Ah, it is the marijuana that has given me what is now termed benign MS. Right. But but I continue to take the medicine that I've taken for 20, over 20 years. And what are you, a uh, tablet or a... Or? Uh, it's been a once-a-week injection. Um, and... Um, of your MS the, treatment, Yeah, right? the MS treatment. It's once a, once a week injection. Um, but, you know, the marijuana, since, that, since the introduction of that, that has, again, I, it's been completely silent. So is your inter, inter, MS injection, that's not, the, that's not your, your THC? Your, no. your, correct. Correct. I, I smoke the marijuana. Okay. And again, first having done that to, you know, to aid myself in sleep, I was having sleeping issues um, and found out, wow, hey, coincidentally, it's been a really long time that I've been well. Um, and maybe it's the medicine. You and know. did you come to that on your own? Or did, like... Well, I then started talking to my doctor and he's like, oh, my God. And again, as Mike quoted, um, you know, the MS Foundation. And again, this started quite a while back, but yeah. the MS Society or Foundation is all on board with this. And what seems to really help are those ailments which are conflicts within the body. A little girl who has epilepsy. Her body's attacking yeah. itself. PTSD, your mind's kind of attacking itself. MS, my body's attacking itself. That's where marijuana really seems to do something we don't understand. Yeah, so I know with the, with the seizures, they want the low PCBs. Low THC, high low, CBD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so is, that, is that a similar situation with MS? Or? It, it's, it's, it's just a blend. It's, again, we don't know. And it's funny, I always talk about the red wine when they tried to identify a you know, pill that's a thousand glasses of red wine. It didn't do anything for health. But drink a glass of red wine every day, and it'll do great things for your health. Yeah. Um, so it, it's hard when we try to westernize or westernize non-Western medicines. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, and Frank, the tough question when Billy asked you how long were you here was that a tough question? Is that too much? Uh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, Billy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councilor Baker, Councilor McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I uh, I had Sal's ringtone and uh, I just wanted to see how it sounded. <laughs> um, Jeff, good to see you again. Uh, you surrounded yourself by really wonderful people. Um, I did hear uh, Mike's golden voice coming over the uh, speaker in my office, so I had to race over. I really have no fight in the game. Obviously, I'm a District 5 uh, uh, city councilor, but I know that District 5 is, is, a, is a prime target for uh, one of these facilities. Uh, so I'm really just trying to learn as much as I can about it. Uh, we've had a candid conversation. I'm not a big fan, but sometimes you win some and you lose some. So I want to make sure whatever happens is, is what's best for everybody, uh, including the industry. Uh, we did uh, spend a couple of days in Denver, um, and I learned a, an awful lot about, uh, about medical marijuana. Uh, certainly learned a lot about the industry itself, the goods and the bads and the indifference. And uh, I think we're doing a, a, a decent job here in, in Boston. Uh, most of the people in Denver continue to say, once when the toothpaste is out of the, out of the tube, you can't get it back in. And uh, I think we're trying to be as restrictive as possible, uh, not a negative reflection of you and your team, but just because this is how, uh, this is how things get out of control quickly. So um, I, know that, I know that I've had a couple of meetings with people who are looking at District 5, so I'm really just here 
uh, to listen and learn. And, uh, and I appreciate you being here. And again, uh, with uh, Frank and Dot and, and, and Mike, you've, you've surrounded yourself by really good people who I trust. So that's a, that's a, that's a bonus. So it's, about, it's about the team. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chip. Uh, thank you, Councilman McCarthy. <clears throat> um, so I just have uh, just a couple of questions. One is um, we talked about supply and demand and that sort of stuff. So how many dispensaries are operating now in the city of Boston? So I think just one at this point, Mr. Chair, uh, the one in your district on 21 Milk Street, and I believe there's about three queuing up. There's some very close to us in Newton and Brookline. Um, Dot Joyce has some experience with having permitted some of that, and I have in other parts. Watertown is there's some pending. At this point, I think only one is open. Okay, and it's, it seems like the two-year exercise just to get a place open. Okay. Correct. And um, so this is, I think, probably our fourth hearing. Uh, on um, on approval or um, non opposition, and uh, what, why don't you tell me a little bit um, about the existing operation? How are they doing? You know, financially, how's that working out? You, you know, Mr. Chairman, um, I was directly involved in the uh, permitting of the Twenty One Milk Street um, dispensary. Uh, I honestly have not been there since. Uh, myself personally, since um, since it opened, <clears throat> not for any particular reason, <clears throat> I just haven't been there. But I'm somewhat in touch with the principles of the company, and it seems to be working. the The thing that I hear over and over and over is that everyone walks by it. Yeah, um, <laughs> that they don't really realize it was there. And um, interestingly, I was just grabbed by someone who was fairly against it, uh, who we know. Um, who attends the regular meetings of the uh, community, and he were, he just voluntarily grabbed me and said, "Hey, I want to let you know something." At the meeting this month, the uh, the police report was very positive, and they actually singled out the dispensary, saying that they've had absolutely no issues whatsoever at that location. And I was very pleased that he, someone who had opposed this proposal, and went out of his way to walk across the room and tell me that. I also know I was during the last few weeks, uh, months, I received a phone call from one of your colleagues, and I honestly cannot remember which colleague, um, asking to, uh, see, they happen to be there with one or two of their colleagues, is it possible to get in? And this is one of the benefits of having a local applicant. Bob Marison, who's from here, was obviously at his cell phone, answered immediately, was able to uh, open the door immediately, because you cannot go in there unless you have you make, um, you know, no non-patient can go in there. A site visit is allowable, uh, but it has to be sanctioned, has to be handled correctly. Um, and so we were able to facilitate that relatively quickly. And so uh, they were able to walk in, take a look at the facility really quickly, get a sense for what was happening in there. Um, and then I heard anecdotally from that that, you know, it seemed good. In terms of numbers and any of those things, I don't have any numbers from you. I hope they're doing well. You know, I hope it's as successful as, um, you know, because they spent a lot of time, a lot of money uh, trying to get there, and, and now they're open, and I'm glad to see it. Um, you know, that's what I've been finding in this industry is that this is a very serious exercise. It requires very serious people who not only have the funds, but the, the long game, the patience, and the ability uh, to do this and to do it responsibly and to engender the credibility of the community in which they're seeking to open. And it was one of the reasons why I think we spent a, a good long time working on this particular team. Um, with Jeff and making sure that we hired the best people for it. If, I, if I may, Billy, yes, please, Mike. Chairman. I happened to visit one of the facilities and spoke with staff as well as the Brookline Police, and they were all pleased. Uh, as a matter of fact, I tried using one of my a badge that I had to try and get into the facility, but like Mike said, then... They weren't allowing anybody in unless you had your ID, and the procedures that were followed were very secure. The police department, more than happy, as a matter of fact, with the opportunity to interact, <coughs> excuse me, to interact with their CCD TV, they were actually able to apprehend someone who had gone by. They identified them that way. So there's that cooperation with the police department and the facilities or dispensaries. Uh, thank you for that. Ms. Joyce, do you have anything to add? 
No, sir. Thank you for having us here. We very much appreciate it. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. At this time, I'd like to um, allow folks for public testimony. Uh, you are welcome to stay if you like, and you're welcome to leave if, you, if, um, if, if you'd like. Uh, the first person up is Marvin Wool. <clears throat> and then uh, Nicole on... Snow, Gary Walker, and then Elliot Lapp. Mr. Wolf. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying that my comments obviously were written before any of the information that uh, you all discussed today uh, was talked about, uh, and of course we have not yet seen the, the presentation that you, you brought. So uh, it ought to be looked at it, uh, in that light. Um, my name is Marvin Wool. I'm a 17-year resident of the Back Bay. I'm also a physician, and I've practiced internal medicine for 25 years. Also, for 14 years, I was the medical director for two different not-for-profit HMOs in Massachusetts. My responsibilities included management of not only outpatient and inpatient services, but also prescription drugs. Now, regrettably, I come at this moment to oppose this application because the evidence available to me today, prior to any new information, and I, I suspect to many others who haven't heard this before, is simply not sufficient at this point to support your application. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Now, first, I'd like to make a couple of disclosures. I have lived in one of the four Prudential Center apartment buildings where both applicant principals also live, but I do not know them. Secondly, I have no affiliation with any other registered marijuana dispensary. Meanwhile, counselors, you are very well acquainted with compassionate, compassionate uh, organics. Just 10 months ago, you unanimously rejected its application for an RMD in Austin. At that time, you had ample evidence to do so. Neither of the principals had any experience in the MRD industry. Further, the Mass Department of Public Health as a scoring system for applicants by which your application scored just above 50%, only 85 out of 163 points. Now, during your Alston application process, nearly two dozen documents were posted on the DPH website. Marvin. Could you yeah. just uh, do me a favor and address us, yeah. the city oh, council? Oh, oh surely. If this is not a give and take with the um, no, no, no. proponent. Oh. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Dur during the Alston application process, nearly two dozen documents were posted on the DPH website, ranging from the original application of intent in June 2015 to the last one in June of last year. Since then, only a single additional document, dated June 1st this year, was posted. It was a third application of intent, and the only 2017 changes were an increase in the capital and a change of bank. Now, you all know that there are three critical elements for licensing a specific RMD at a specific site. One is the zoning of the site for which the ZBA is ultimately responsible. Another is the strength and sources of the applicant's financing, which the DPH decides. Last, but hardly least, is the experience and qualifications of the operator. Last August, you, the council, considered this very carefully and by unanimous vote, found compassionate organics wanting. Since then, not a publicly 
single publicly available document up until this morning or press account has signaled that anything is different now than it was. Now, I'm sure that the applicants have been at work in this time. Now, you, you all on the council know how important it is to get this right. RMD serve some of our most vulnerable neighbor, neighbors. Now, what I would like to suggest, there are only six uh, councilors who are present today. Uh, there's a lot of material to digest, and I hope that rather than going ahead with your vote tomorrow, you would allow some of the rest of this to play out, na namely the contact of the applicant with the, the neighborhoods and the business community to, so that they can better understand what is being proposed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Nicole Snow. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Snow. I reside at 190 Bridge Street in Salem, Massachusetts. I am the executive director of the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance. Uh, that organization uh, stands for patients that um, stand to serve from the medical marijuana program in Massachusetts. Uh, thank you all for having me, and it's good to see you all again. I am happy to see the Compassionate Organics team refreshed, renewed, and ready to achieve standards Massachusetts expects. Um, I also want to say that I am um, a registered patient and I uh, suffer from a debilitating condition, a painful condition in my neck, uh, resulting from chronic long-standing whiplash and multiple car accidents. So while I might not have a uh, terminal condition, I do suffer from daily debilitating pain. And I'm a professional woman, and I frequent Boston a lot. And while I'm helping um, the city council build this medical marijuana program within the boundaries of Boston, I realized that I was able to conduct business and pop into 21 Milk Street and pick up some medicine for the week which was under $25. And at that moment, I realized, wow, I can do all of these things, my work, um, visit somebody's office, and then not spend a lot of my time going out to look for um, medical marijuana. And all of the city's neighborhoods are very different and wonderful, and they all bring different visitors and different workers to their locality. And Newberry Street in Back Bay is no different. And I love Newberry Street, and I know a lot of people that love to go visit um, and shop and work and go to school. And this is just going to be one of those boutique facilities that you're able to pop into, provided that this, this organization uh, continues to live up to those standards that we expect. And the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance is no different. We want to see high standards of security, um, clinical environment, customer service, and dignity and respect when dealing with these conditions. Um, because, you know, when we're talking about adult use, we're not talking about the same kind of consumer. We're talking about someone who is exasperated, exhausted, they need attention, and they want a little bit more guidance than someone who is using it for um, to get high on a Friday night. So, how was your experience at Twenty One Milk Street? It was great. It was my first time visiting. Um, they, you walk in with your card and your ID, and everyone is very cordial and inviting. And um, the the PCAs, I think it's the PSA, the patient, what is it called, PSA or PSA? Yeah. Patient care attendant, PCA, that's right. And um, everyone is knowledgeable about what they, they have uh, available that day, what 
um, discounts might be happening that day and what uh, might be able to help my condition Great. that is available that day. And I was actually really kind of surprised because I, I didn't know what to expect. So I brought a, you know, a handy amount of money with me. And, you know, I wound up spending less than $30 for something that I need. Right. And I think that, you know, being able to do that while I'm, I'm working downtown and not spend a lot of time after I leave Boston looking for another place to find medicine, I thought that was fantastic. So I really think that Back Bay would be no different. And I, I hope that, um, that this committee would also think that way, too. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Uh, Gary Walker? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, members of the City Council, uh, I think most of you know me, but my name is Gary Walker, and I represent the men and women of the Electrical Workers Local 103. Um, probably asking why, why, why is someone from Local 103 so interested in uh, medical marijuana facilities? Well, one thing about Local 103 is we always pride, it, pride ourselves on whenever a new industry comes to the city, whether it's uh, solar energy, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, uh, casino gambling, whatever it happens to be, it comes to our area, we get out ahead of it and we try to make sure that we can secure those jobs for our membership. Um, whether they're building, you know, a, a, a store, whether they're, whatever they happen to be building. So we, did, we, we reached out to um, a variety of these different uh, entities coming into the city and other parts of the area, and they, they were very, very receptive to us. Uh, they, they committed right off the bat to um, uh, building these facilities with the men and women from the city of Boston that work under the uh, collective bargaining uh, agreements with the building trades. Uh, so you all know what that means. Um, obviously, they're going to have good pensions. They're going to have good uh, wages, good health benefits, uh, the whole nine yards. So. Um, I'll be very brief, but that's really, in a nutshell, why we, 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 we're here to support um, uh, this, this facility and maybe others in the, in, in the uh, community. And um, I appreciate your support also. Thank you. Gary, Gary, can yes. I ask a question, Mr. Chair? I uh, sure. H have you guys uh, been involved in any of the growth? Not yet. We have been talking about the Fitchburg facility and others, but Fitchburg uh, isn't in our area. It's, that would be in the Worcester jurisdiction of the IBW, but we have been talking about it, and that's obviously something that we're very interested in. Obviously, a, a store has, um, you know, lighting, the, the, yeah, the regular minimal. things, everything else has, but obviously heavily, you know, he heavy-duty security systems, it's pretty, it's pretty involved electrically for, for us. But obviously, those growth facilities be something that we're definitely looking at, and we, we've gotten good uh, responses from those that we talked to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for your testimony. Elliot Laffer. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I didn't expect to talk today, which is why I don't have a tie on. Um, it's okay. It's okay. That's good. Frank, Frank doesn't either, so. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, yeah but he's elected. <laughs> um, and I, I just wanted to explain to you where the Neighborhood Association is in the process because Councilor Zakem had, uh, had said, well, they're here, they'll probably tell us something. And really all that we're going to tell you <laughs> is that the purpose of our, of, of our meeting next, uh, or week after next, is to really evaluate the proposal, which we haven't studied in, in detail, uh, and the people. And our committee will then make a, a recommendation to our executive committee. What we under, what, the way we understand the process, uh, there was a time constraint that said that, that the council needed to um, move within a certain time frame or the application would expire. And so that this is largely about confirming a fact, which is that the zoning allows this to happen if the Board of Appeals allows it to happen. And uh, we expect to, uh, to present our position to the Board of Appeals, um, but that we didn't want to say, well, Let's get in the way right now when there's a time constraint that, that, uh, that appears to be there and, and say, well, okay, it's all over because the time constraint's in the way. And that's where we are now, why we can't advise what our members or what our board suggests because we haven't made that, uh, had that meeting yet. Great. Um, thank you, Elliot. And um, thank you for your service to our city for so many years in the Groundwater Trust and all the good things you do. 
it just lets me get older and older and older. And thank you now that you're going to be uh, joining us in the, in the world of people that um, don't get paychecks from the last place you got a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, and thanks again. Uh, Councilors, have any questions? Uh, yep. Um, uh, not a question, but just to follow up on, on Elliot's comments, um, as similar to my understanding is that if the council were to act favorably on this, it is merely non-opposition as opposed to an endorsement or support. And I personally, as I expect my colleagues, uh, would, would feel that um, certainly reserve final judgment on whether this is an appropriate location and operator, although I think we've heard a lot of positive um, information today and see that plan. Um, as the process continues, I think relying on a, the Department of Public Health and the community process through the Zoning Board of Appeal um, and others to uh, to continue this. But I think it is important to, you know, as a neighbor, I live probably six, looking at the map, seven, eight blocks away, um, you know, making sure that this, you know, at first blush, this is not, this is not an inappropriate location, um, which I think is really all that we're talking about uh, here today and to continue that process and having relying on Department of Public Health and ultimately the Public Health Commission here in the city um, to look at the fit of uh, fitness um, and ability of the team here and the Zoning Board of Appeal, which has a robust, obviously, community process to make sure that both our business and residential neighbors are well represented, obviously, given the time constraints. This had to move a little faster, I think, than we normally would have before a neighborhood association's uh, able to officially act on it. But I think, um, if we are to act favorably on this at our at our upcoming meeting, uh, it certainly would be with the understanding this is merely a non-opposition, and uh, we're certainly reserving judgment and looking forward to a continued community process. Thank you, Councilor Zagan. Nope. All right, so I want to uh, thank you all for coming here and presenting. I, I, I would add that, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah McKinnon. Someone just slid that. <laughs> under my chin and I didn't pay attention. You're up. No problem, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, and the rest of the council here. Uh, my name is Jeremiah McKinnon. Um, I am an advisory board member of the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance. I reside at 39 North Central Street in Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, I briefly just wanted to say I am a patient myself that actually works and helps a lot of other patients uh, getting through the system, finding uh, the appropriate dispensary. And a lot of people are looking for safe access in their neighborhoods. So I do ask you to support the, uh, granting a non-opposition letter to Compassion Organics. Um, I do find that most patients are easier to be able to find dispensaries that are closer to public transportation. Um, and I, I wanted to just add a couple of things that I wanted to add is that uh, there's actually 11 dispensaries open at the current moment. The 11th that opened was in Georgetown in May. Um, and about the price of marijuana going down, in around 2014 when the first dispensaries opened, the average price was about $385 to $350 an ounce. And now in this year, uh, mul multiple dispensaries have brought their prices down. It can be brought down to $325. 300, 292, 270, 250, all sorts of different things that are going on nowadays, bringing the prices down. As uh, the young lady here has mentioned, that uh, we, as more dispensaries come open, there will be more, uh, you know, competition, and the price uh, continues to go down. So, uh, I ask you guys to support the non-opposition letter, and uh, thank you very much for letting me speak today. What's what's the would you know the price of the black market for an ounce? Um, I would say they are always trying to undercut the legal market. So I would say uh, getting near $250 an ounce is getting very close to the black market. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Joe. No problem. Um, the point I was going to make before um, uh, Jeremiah testified was also that um, in the next few weeks, we will be um, um, having a hearing for the seven reappointments and new appointment of the ZBA. So they'll be here in front of us, and that the city council plays a significant role even after the fact that we, um, that, uh, we may uh, uh, vote on non-opposition. And I thought that was kind of relevant. All right? So, with all that good news, good luck, and uh, this hearing is ended. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you.